Hey guys, my name is Mavi and I've spent the last 14 years in the plastic surgery and beauty industry, working alongside top board certified plastic surgeons. Now I'm an independent patient coordinator who doesn't work for any surgeon. This means I have unbiased reviews for hundreds of doctors and I can help you achieve the look of your dreams, whether that's a supernatural or a video vixen. I use my professional and personal plastic surgery experience to help you look and feel your best. Join in on the fun as I talk to plastic surgery experts, friends, and real-life patients about all things plastic surgery. Should be fun. Hey guys, do I have the episode for you today? I'm super excited to have our first male surgeon from Mexico, Dr. Pedro Matias, a board-certified plastic surgeon out of Guadalajara. Hello, Dr. Matias. Hi, hi everybody. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to talk about all the questions that will be coming along with, with our talk. Yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be super, super educational. Our listeners love learning about all of the ins and outs of the industry. And I think it would be really amazing for us to really just educate them on skin tightening technologies. So I was looking through your podcast prep form and I saw that that's something that you're really, really interested in and skin tightening technologies. And I think if you could educate our audience, please take the mic and you can tell us a little bit about yourself and also how skin tightening technologies are used in your practice. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Pedro Matias Ramirez. I'm a plastic a board certified plastic surgeon here in the city of Guadalajara, Mexico. When being involved in what is the plastic surgery, we have to take along with the new technologies that have been coming along, you know, because it has evolved during this past year, this past decade at least, always trying to improve our results. So the same brands, the same labs, the same technicians that design these machines, try to do better, try to understand how the skin works, how it's going to compensate the surgery that we perform on our patients. So we have taken too many steps forward on the using of these technologies and also improving with this, the results of our patients, the outcomes. So what is the skin tightening? It's a measure that we try to accomplish for instead of having skin, loose skin that is in our bodies, try to compensate what the uh, body is incapable of. It may be with because of hormonal type, because of the skin itself, because of the aging, or because it was really too loose from the very beginning. But uh, the skin retraction itself is going to have its limits. So everybody's trying to accomplish with minimal incisions what we could accomplish in so many years ago, only by cutting the skin and getting rid of it. So we have different measures to work with this skin retraction or skin tightening. So one of them that we use on a daily basis, and you've been called, uh, or maybe you recall of it, it's uh, the body tight. The body type is one of the most famous and branded nowadays. It's one of the newest also. The thing that the body type uses is with radio frequency. It tries to heat up the skin after we do the lipo. So with every technology that we are using for skin retraction, it must be included with a liposuction of the area that's going to be treated. We cannot do only the skin retraction without making the lipo because if not, since this type of technology uses heat for making the retraction itself, then the tissue that it's all along aside, the area where we're going to work, is going to be affected as well. And if we are talking about maybe fat tissue that is underneath adipocyte, they will dissolve, they will be affected by the heat of the machine used. So first of all, we have to know that every brand of these kind of uh, machines need to be used on the OR and need to be used while performing a lipo, all right? It cannot be used after the surgery. It cannot be used before the surgery or it cannot be used only by a procedure itself. It must be coming along with the lipo. Well, putting that aside, uh, starting with one of the newest brands, I was telling you, the body type. The body type is one of the newest machines that are on the market. It's one of the most famous after it. 
it comes along with uh, so many other special devices like the Morpheus 8. But talking uh, about what it happens on the skin itself, it's with the use of the radio frequency that emits the handpiece from the body tight. It helps for heating the, the skin to a certain level that it is determined by the device itself and is measured by two thermometers. You know, the handpiece is composed from two pieces. One that is on the outside that maybe you all have seen. It's an, a green arc that goes over the skin, but underneath it, not in so many videos you can watch it, but some of uh, the videos you may see on Instagram or in YouTube videos, you may see that there is one other cannula that goes underneath the skin. So between those two models, there are one electrode on each other and an electric thing electricity is passing through those electrodes for making the radio frequency and heating the skin. Also, each of the parts has a thermometer by itself. So it is the device is telling us the temperature that we are reaching on the outside layer of the skin and on the inside as well. So to prevent burning. Uh, when we use the heat to make the retraction of the skin, it's like picture like if when you put a steak on a pan, and then the steak is going to shrink because of the heat. It's the same, the same thing that we're trying to accomplish. Well, we're trying to accomplish not burning the patient. Uh, the thermometers guide us at what uh, levels we have to reach and what we have to, what time, how many time we have to give it for the machine to work. There are some surgeons that measure it by the kilojoules of electricity that is, is passing through the electrodes, and our other ones are are guided by the heat and me and myself i try to reach the limit of the machine try to make the best as we can with the with the device since it's not cheap not the handpiece not the use of it we have to make the best as we can right maximize the results yeah and making uh, the best as we can and it's because we like to give the results to our patients as promised so this is one of the machines that, that is one of the most famous of all, the body tight. It works that way. The Morpheus say that it can be used without going into the OR. It's the same type of electricity that's passing, but it's passing through needles. It may be doing in the office. It's not uh, too invasive. You will need to have some type of anesthesia because Still, there are needles passing through the skin several times and making an electricity discharge. But the results are really, really good. It helps for the skin to, tight, to tighten itself by the needles passing through, making the discharge, heating the skin. But still, you want to accomplish the same results as with the body type. Since the body type is more invasive, is the one that's going to make the best of it from the whole device. What's the difference between the Bodytight and some other brands that are known on the market? The Renewing J Plasma and as uh, the Baser and as Microair. Well, each of these devices work in a different way. So you cannot compare one to another. It works or tend to work different from, from each other. So the Bodytight works strictly on skin retraction. You cannot do lipo with it, or it's not a good device for making lipo. It's not uh, used for making suction and taking the fat out. You may burn the fat and make it a little bit slimmer, but still you won't have a good effect or you cannot be satisfied, but only that. So you have to make the lipo, you then pass the Bodytight through it, and then it's gonna look better. So. With the base, with the uh, uh, Renewing J Plasma, it's most the competition with the body type. It uses cold plasma for making the retraction of the skin. The way that the fat tissue is along the body, imagine that you're watching a beehive, where when it's filled up with the honey itself, it's like that very same way the fat is disposed in our wall. It's, it's found on our tissue. It has some walls that sustain the fat tissue where it belongs to be. When we make the liposuction, some of those walls break apart. So what is, we try to accomplish with the Renew Plasma is 
with the plasma, it makes some retraction and these small walls that were destroyed but still are attached maybe to the skin or maybe to the down layers near to the muscle tries to attach itself so the skin goes more tight to the body, right? It's different because we're not using the heat itself to retract the skin in between, but it's trying to stick up the skin to the body. So it works different. You cannot compare one another. And it may help to more patients depending on the procedure and depending on what's going to be their post-surgical process. Because if you're doing an aggressive lipo, then you're going to destroy too many lymphatic vessels and the patient, it won't be easy for them to get rid of the swelling, the liquid that their body is producing because of the swelling. So they're going to need some therapies for helping the body dispose all that liquid for avoiding seroma forever, avoiding infection, because the body itself uh, won't have the lymphatic vessels and uh, for handling that and disposing it by the pee. So if there is a patient that needs to have too many lymphatic massages and then passing through uh, maybe vacuum and other therapies like that in the post-surgical process, the thing that you accomplish with the J-plasma will screw up. It won't help because you will tear up the skin apart once again from the body and then it won't stick it up nicely, you know? It's mm -hmm. like you're, you're destroying what you try to accomplish in the OR. So that's why you can see that the Renewing J Plasma is so famous in the United States, but the body type is maybe more famous in Latin America. And it's not because each machine is come from a different country, even uh, it's on how you are using the machine and how aggressive and what kind of liposuction are you making. If you are going aggressive, you're going to need therapies. If you're needing therapies, maybe the J-plasma is not the best option for you. You know, mm -hmm. if you're not going that aggressive, if you're more conservative, if the amount of uh, lipo they're making, uh, it's around one or two liters, well, in, in a normal average person, then the lymphatic vessels won't be that destroyed and you may come along with the J-plasma and it will work uh, incredible for you. But if not, if you're going aggressive, maybe the body ties is the best machine for you. You know, that's how mm -hmm. you need to be looking for. It depends on how, on the amount of fat tissue that's going out of your body, right? Right. And what is coming next also. These two technologies try to specialize on the skin retraction, on try to avoid loose skin. But then we have some other brands or some other names that, well, Ring of Stone, like maybe Microair, maybe Baser. These are the ones, body tightening J Plasma are the ones that are specialized on skin tightening and, and improving the results with the liposuction. And the Microair, the Baser, and the other machines are machines for making the lipo itself, right? So it's the conventional lipo that's a uh, where we, everybody learn, and it's with the normal cannulas, the very same way we, we have been doing it for maybe 30 years. And then we started adding some devices for improving how we make the lipo. So we have Baser and we have Micro, two of the most famous of them. Baser is going to be the lipo laser. It's not a laser itself. It's not like a beam of ray that's going to destroy the adipocytes and be easy to, to extract them from the body. But is the cannula has uh, like an optical and that passes heat through it. And the heat is going to make the lipo easier to have better results, less damage of the skin, but still we're treating the cells that we are extracting with heat, you know? So mm -hmm. it's easier to make in the lipo. It gives us better results because we are dealing with less amount of uh, not only stress, but difficulties for extracting the, the amount of fat tissue that we are, were proposed to, to get. But still, it may damage a little bit the cells that we are extracting because of the heat itself, right? So this is controversy of when to use it. That's why not all the doctors try to use it. Somebody may say that they don't even like it because they, the heat of the cannula 
since it's in the point of the cannula, it may happen that it may burn the skin. It may go a little bit under this, uh, not under the skin, but is easily or more easily to make a perforation on the abdomen wall and they don't feel that safe, all right? It's not because of the device itself, but it's because you have to be very cautious of how you do it and how you treat it. The micro air on the other part, it's not uh, working with heat, it's working with ultrasound with the vibration of the cannula itself. So it's a cannula conventional with no type of energy that's on the on the metal of the cannula, but the cannula itself, the whole metal is vibrating with an ultrasound, well, with radio frequency and it helps for dissolving the fat tissue easier. So the micro air is helpful not only for the patient, but for the surgeon as well. It's easier for us for making the lipo because it doesn't make us really, really hard to extract the fat from the body. It may destroy fibrosis in an easier way. It's less damage of the skin. I get less tired with working with the device. So it's a win-win for everybody. And since it has no disposables, you buy it one time, you use it, you have to give it maintenance and maybe buy a second hand piece, but you may use it with several patients because the disposables are out of the chart and you don't care about them. You can use it several times and all those times it's going to work incredible. I really like the micro air and I've in in the past, most of the practices that I was working with, we did mainly micro air versus vaser. And I think it's really interesting if we could talk about this. There's like a a common myth that if you're going to have a fat transfer, there's one way that's better to extract the fat. Which way is it? It's with the micro air. It's because it's less damage to the tissue itself. It's like I was saying, the heat of the cannula with the vaser may affect the cell that you're extracting from the body. So Mm -hmm. maybe that cell is going to have some amount of damage. Maybe it won't when transferred to the body or to the hips or to every part of the body that you like. It may not adapt as well as if it was only extracted and rip it apart, then to be heated and then rip it apart. You know, the heat is one of the damages that we try to avoid the most. That's why. Like I was telling you before, the J plasma and the body type, you need to make the lipo first and then use these kind of devices. Because if not, the fat tissue that you're going to extract won't work for this fat transfer. You know, the vaser doesn't heat up that much, but still, you have that little spine that doesn't let you feel right about it. And since you try to reach perfection, we won't reach it ever, but still we are on the on on the race we're reaching for the stars yeah so every time high and we try to do uh, as best as possible and try to avoid any kind of damage to the tissue we're working with for it to be preserved as best as we can so in my perception and what we've seen with colleagues and everything I think that micro air is not only easier but safer and it's better for making the lipo there are going to be some colleagues that may even classify me because I'm telling this because they own the device of Vaser, but it's only my perception. Maybe uh, you can talk with other surgeons and see how they think about, and then we can make a round table. That would be that would be that good. Would be awesome. So we can everybody discuss the, their own patients, what are their perspectives, and how they have evolved during time and how many fat absorption I've seen. And even though, you know, uh, we try to to see it that way, that with uh, how more or less uh, fat absorption we have, because of fat transfer is the machine that we are using or the technique, and maybe doesn't even reside on us. Sometimes it's on the patient's health that if his body is more of a catabolism way, then he's going to try to uh, dissolve more fat than it's needed. 
even though he's eating well, or maybe if the medication is not right, or they feel nauseated, or they are vomiting, or they don't have a good progress, or they are not eating well, then the body won't be waiting for you to give him energy. He's going to take it anyway. And the easiest way is from the buttocks. So even though we use the technology, the first step of using it is for taking care of the patient's safety, you know, then searching for the results, right? For every piece of, the, of technology that we try to get, that we try to use, that we try to improve our results with, is patient safety first. And then we come along and we'll see how the results really work out. And maybe it won't work out with every doctor because even though we are all plastic surgeons, we work very different from one another. There are some ones that are very aggressive. There are some are not all, they're more conservative, but still it will depend on how your surgeon likes to work. So don't focus only on the machine itself, but on the compound of the machine and the surgeon. Absolutely. What kind of technology do you like? You know, I, I noticed on your on your form that you mentioned that there was no other option for a second career because your father is a plastic surgeon. And I think it would be really interesting if you could give us an insight on what, how has the industry or what have you seen change watching it with your father and his him and his practice and now having your practice. That's so interesting. I, I'm, I can't wait to hear. Yeah, I put that in the forum because it's one of the things that involved me into, into the medicine and plastic surgery itself. I studied to be a doctor because of my father. My father is a plastic surgeon. He's located in the city of Chihuahua, but he did his specialty in, in the Ciudad de Mexico, in the country's capital. And he's quite awesome. He's amazing, more in the reconstructive area. He is marvelous. He specializes on hand reconstructive surgery and everything that goes with facial surgery and breast surgery. What happens with that? What's been involving during these years? From the past decade or maybe the last 15 years and forward, the plastic surgery has evolved to new levels, to most in the aesthetic part. We have reached extreme results, extreme changes with less amount of procedures in the same time that we're doing uh, mixing procedures, seeking combinations, what can we do, what can we accomplish, reaching the limits, breaking them sometimes, but with safety, doing research about it and improving. If my father and I will make a lipo, well, we have done it. And sometimes he says, that's enough. And I say, <laughs> we're not even starting. So uh, in the aesthetic part, well, I'm the one that's more, uh, not only aggressive, but more experienced because I love that part from the plastic surgery. You know, he was always involved on taking care of the patients and uh, having this human side with him. And when I was little, I got along with him at the hospital. Not always I was allowed to enter because, well, still is a hospital, no kids allowed. But when I was around 12, 13 years old, that I can go more with him to see how his work was and see the gratitude of their patient, of his patients to be joyful of what they have accomplished, of even if it was an accident, a trauma or anything like that, and they have recovered function of the hand, they have recovered function of the, of the muscles of the face uh, or with a fracture or anything like that. I saw that expression and I, it was amazing. It was, uh, it was my hero, it is my hero. And he, Always have this with the patients. Never lose the touch of a patient. Never lose the contact of a patient. Treat them as equal. Treat them as human because you're dealing with human beings. And sometimes in medicine, we take a step and we don't want to look back. We don't like to want to look down. So I saw this perspective of him. He always treated the patients with uh, every virtue. So well, it touched me, it get me, and I tried to accomplish that. He advised me not to do it. He advised me to try it. any other career I like in my life because it's a dedication of a full life, you know? 
And it's a progress and it's a career that not always you can accomplish, even though you can pay it, even though you can study it, the exams are not easy and the process and the filters for reaching where you want to be, it's not accomplished by everybody. So uh, my father was watching all my perspective of what's going to be happening with my life. And he said, like, you better have a life. You haven't seen me at all. Didn't you remember that I was on the hospital 24-7? So I didn't care about it. And, well, I don't regret it at all. And, well, when I was now in plastic surgery and I started to see many other doctors, young ones, much younger than my dad. Maybe my dad was one of the pioneers with the lipo. And nowadays there is so much to do with it. And so many levels that we can accomplish that even he gets amazed of the results. Now he's getting used to it because he's seeing it more frequently with our results and everything. But still, he won't risk it like that because he wasn't trained like that. Because in those ages, they weren't even expecting that, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, we haven't had the monitoring that we are having right now all the studies for making the patients feeling safe and knowing that they're going to be safe, that they're with no disease at all, that they are great about it, and that we can endure the the surgery all along. So with every step of the way that we are progressing on aesthetic plastic surgery, we have been proving the safety measures for taking that step safely, you know? So these are the things that we cannot skip. We have to continue making the surgeries on a certified, completely fully functional hospital, not on a clinic. If something goes wrong, there are precious moments, few minutes that may change the outcome in a big, big manner. So this is one of the most important things that we cannot put aside. Absolutely. I'm so glad you touched on that. Something so important that we talk about on the show all the time is safety and being a smart consumer is making sure that you're doing things safely. Right. One of those it may things. Be, it may be more expensive because it is. You can only enter to the emergency room and see how maybe one or two hours of being there on a consultation is going to be on cost. So you cannot expect for being a full day over there with the uh, fully equipped OR, with having all the monitors on you during the procedure, after the procedure, to having all the medication through the IV, all the nurses that are going to be taking care of you, having at your disposal, at your disposition, the intensive care unit, the blood band, the intermediate care unit, every specialty that may be needed if, if it's really needed. So there are so many things that you have to take into acquaintance that you cannot expect to be cheap, you know, but it's because you are investing in the vehicle of your life. So you cannot go cheap with it. It's not because it's a fancy hospital. It's not because it looks nice. It's because it's full equipped against any kind of complication, you know? Absolutely. So you don't have to risk it. You don't have to roll the dices. There is no, there doesn't have to be any dices, you know? And even though with all of that, we cannot go 100% sure there is not going to be a complication. No, there are some times that are unavoidable, even though we make studies, we ask for the cardiologist to look out our patients. We have all the studies. We have everyone that's working along with us certified to be the very best of the best. And even though we cannot skip some complications that may happen and it's out of our hands, but Being in a good institution, being in a good hospital, we have the arms or we have the means to fight it and to accomplish a good outcome, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's really important. I know that you have a large community of patients that are coming from the U.S. to see you in Mexico. Yeah, actually, most of my patients come uh, from abroad. I, we have many patients coming from the U.S., different cities. Actually, it's not only one city, it's not only one location. I have patients from California, from Seattle, from Chicago, from New York, from many places over the states, Minnesota as well. And, and, and I'm glad because I always have loved the states. I grew up and I was, I was born and grew up near the border. I was 
I'm from Chihuahua City, that's uh, almost four hours from the border to El Paso, Texas. And I've always loved to go to the U.S. and I love all the U.S. food, as you love, maybe love the Mexican food. But still, I love too much of their history of, of what's going on with uh, <laughs> every step of the way with the U.S. So I like to meet the patients and, and try to know how they are living and what's their city and where are located. And it's, it's great for me because I've been reaching more than I was expecting at the very first time. And now my patients, like I told you, is, are more from the States, are from Canada, from Montreal, and from Quebec, I have some patients. And now we're going over the seas. I have patients from Denmark, I have patients from Australia, I have one patient from South Africa, New Zealand. They're coming uh, from, from all, all over. parts from the world, and, and I'm glad to meet them. And sometimes they bring me like souvenirs. Most of them bring me like something. There is a patient of mine that it's the second time she comes. The first time she was very glad she returned back home to Australia. And we were talking during the consultations after her surgery about the, the different flavors they have of that. And there's a thing that's called Vigimite. And it's like for spreading on toast. And it's very famous over there. It's salty, extremely salty. Uh, not very, not many people out from Australia that tasted like it. But my wife once told me about it. So I asked the patient and she sent me some samples. I don't know what happened. They didn't reach the border or uh, they, they retained it there. Maybe they tasted it and they didn't like it and tossed them. So now that she has come back, she bring me one herself and some uh, chocolates and everything. And... I like to enjoy the flavors of the world. So I'm glad for knowing many persons from all around. And sometimes it's difficult because we're trying to uh, uh, stick up with the patients through all the period of the recovery process. So I had to make sure that they are searching for recovery. Well, not only recovery houses, but therapies that can take care of them when they go back home. That's that's where we take the step by step, where when we have one other patient that uh, has a scale with us, we always say you, you have to start searching for options. And then we go to Instagram and we start searching for options too as well, just to get in, in touch with people that are working in their cities, in their countries to see or to which destination they can travel near them so they can have their full progress because they may be spending here around 7, 10, or even 14 days, depending on the procedure with me. But when they go along, they need to complete their progress. They need to complete the therapies. They need to keep looking for the things that are going to be changing in their body. And if they leave it alone and don't care about it, the result may go to Change. waste. Yeah, totally. I think you're seeing a lot of traffic or a lot of overall from all around the world patients to come see you because there's a certain look that they're looking for and they're not doing that in Canada <laughs> and they're right. not doing it in other countries. <laughs> Many of my patients, they see me my results on Instagram and they all are, they are looking at what they see. They There are some of them that may ask more extravagant results or something bigger than expected or than the usual. They want that the you extra, can, extra, extra large. Extra, extra large. <laughs> Even though I try to convince them that it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be like a walk in the park. It's too hard to be in handling all that weight. You know, the big, big curves, eventually they're going to start to fall down because they are residing on the tension of the skin. So we cannot pretend that when we go with the big, big buttocks, uh, the BBLs, or the extremely BBLs, eventually it's weight that's residing on the skin and the skin is going to lose because it's the weight plus the gravity against the skin. The skin is still the one that always loses. It's like if you use some earrings that are very, very heavy, uh, eventually your earlobe is going to look all elongated, right? So the skin expands. And the more weight you put, the more it's going to span. You cannot avoid that. So many of the patients that come from abroad, or most of them, try to look the results that they're trying to look more skinny, not, not that curvy. We can do curvy, 
but it will depend on the bone structure and the physical anatomy of the very same patient. You know, when I tell my wow. patients, how would you like to look? You have to bring me some pictures just to get into your mind to see how much is too much for you. Because the thing we don't grab is that the aesthetics is subjective. Maybe we can see both of us. We can see past one girl on the street and maybe for you, it's going to be too little. For me, it's going to be too much, you know, but I need to know for the patient how much is too much. And, and I love this part because they're very descriptive. It's like, doctor, it's, I, I want a saw, but not too much, but I want it to show, but uh, not to look like I have surgery, but to be look big, but they cannot explain themselves. But natural. And I say like, yes, but no. And, and I cannot get the idea. So I, I, it's easier for me to see it in pictures and to see, okay, this is too much. And as I can see in the picture, the relation between the hips, the buttocks, and their waist. And I know what proportions in their body she likes. And now I have what need to be done to try to accomplish those percentage or those figures, you know? It's not mm -hmm. like, I, I asked for the pictures, not because they're gonna look the same. It's obvious that it's not gonna be possible because they are two different persons. But how I need to work your body to try to assimilate to what you're trying to accomplish, you know? Absolutely. So lastly, I think I want to touch on compression and the different time recommendations that are everywhere from three weeks to a year and how long in between. This is a nerve you're touching because <laughs> everybody feels and, and gives different specifications about it, but I'm gonna try to stick up with the science not the perspective and how it has worked with me and how it has worked with any other colleague or how many studies have you seen. It's, let's go to the very basics, how the body works. So the recovery process of any wound is gonna be on healing and making scar tissue. Keep it clean and try to seal it up. The body won't care about the aesthetics at all, you know? The only thing that worries the body is to paste all over again, try to repair everything. It won't care if it's well repaired or not repaired, give it function only, but still it's going to try to recover. And we have to guide all these steps that it's going to take. So after the scar tissue is formed, that is around the first 14 days or two weeks, however you would like to see it, then, and the, and the wound is completely closed then it's going to pass something that's called reconstruction of, of the same scar tissue. You know, it's going to make the scar tissue is going to be replaced by the type of tissue that belongs there, you know? So okay. this process lasts about three months. That's why everybody tells the patients that at least three months to start seeing results because the scar tissue itself lasts that long to stop working, you know? And it's gonna depend still, depend on how the patient does the scar tissue because it's not gonna be the same to a patient that is on his genetics or not on her genetics to do caloids as to one that goes into hypertrophic scar tissue or the ones that make very nice scar tissue. And it also will be modified by the type of the skin. And I'm not talking about color, I'm talking about thickness. The thickness of the skin is going to be affected as, as well as for the retraction, the scar tissue that's forming underneath and everything. And there comes along the thing that worries the most and the thing that everybody's more scared. And it's only a natural process, the famous fibrosis. Fibrosis, you have to understand, fibrosis cannot be avoided. Fibrosis is a natural process process of the body. It's only a different way of calling the scar tissue, but only is, is, it's the scar tissue that's making some retractions or it's sticking too much into the body that if you may find it on your hand, if you cut your hand and you have a, a deep wound, 
and then they seal it up, they do the stitches. Fibrosis is going to come along with that scar and maybe it's going to grab the tendons of your hand and you won't be able to move your hand. That's why you have to go as fast as you can to, to therapies for moving the tendons, for moving the hand, for avoiding for the scar tissue that's forming on that wound to stick up the tendons and, and paralyze your hand, you know? Mm -hmm. And for every part of the body that we're going to be affecting with the surgery, scar tissue is going to form in that part, even with a needle. Every time a patient uh, gets a shot on the buttocks, a scar tissue forms after the needle is extracted from the body because the needle uh, cut the way through to the very bottom, released the drug that was being inserted. And then when you extract the needle, the normal process of the body is to fill it up that space that was, that was cut by the needle, you know. So mm -hmm. underneath the skin, the scar tissue is going to form. And we have to work with that scar tissue. You cannot tell the body how to heal itself. It's already on our genetics, but we can guide it. We can guide it with therapies. We can guide it with the compression. So at least for three months, the compression must be wear 24-7. What type of compression? It will depend on the type of surgery that was made on you. You cannot make the progression for a type 1 faja to a type 2 when it was very aggressive, when it was with technology as well, when it was over the limit because it will damage your skin, it will burn your skin, and the famous burns of uh, the skin from the faja is because faja of burn. the faja burn. It's not because of the faja itself, but it's the compression that it's avoiding for the blood to be reaching that part of the body, and it will tend to necrosis, you know? Mm -hmm. If you detect it promptly, if you detect it in the very first steps, it's going to be a mark in your skin and won't be for more than two or three weeks. But if you're not checking yourself, you're not watching the mirror, seeing how the fact is working, and not only on the figure that it's been doing, but on the, how is it damaging the skin, then we can go along. You don't have sensitivity at all because it's affected because of the same lipo. And then it's going to appear on your skin, but it's going to look not only like a burn it's going to look black and skin is going to fall apart because that was left without circulation and without oxygen and remember every cell of the body needs oxygen for surviving you know so at least three months with the compression uh how to be changing from fajas that's going to be related specifically depending on the type of surgery who made the surgery and what are the directions or indications from the surgeon Mm -hmm. Right. I always like to remind my girls, my listeners, because they're so ready to jump into a stage two. They're like ready. They're ready to get into a stage two because they think it's going to make their result better. Right. And because the stage two fascia looks fabulous. But still, if you're not prepared, you're only going to make more damage than good. And for mm -hmm. the long term, the therapist alongside the surgeon need to be taken into account when changing fajas because the surgeon knows how much he did in the OR and the therapist is feeling all the way down which every therapy that is done on the patient. So together, they have to take the decision on when to try to progress from one faja to another. And still, exactly. I love when they are ready for the step to Faja and they try it and they say like, oh my God, I cannot handle this. It's, <laughs> it's too strong. I had to release it on the night and say, don't rush it. You're not going to like it. The step one Faja is uh, it's nice. You feel secure. Comfortable. It's, good, comfort. it's soft. It's stretchy, but Correct. it's still compressing. But you just uh, try to use a step two Faja and you say like, how am I going to go? go breathing out of here, it's not possible, you know? Absolutely. And maybe you can wait for a while, but uh, you reach the night and you say like, oh my God, I cannot handle it one second more. So uh, that comes along another question of my patients, which brand is the best? There are so many brands and they are uh, so into perfection of how they do their products that most of them are very, very, very good brands. 
which one is gonna suit you best, which one is the best of all, the one that you choose. It's like the wine. Since everyone is different, their body is gonna be different, and the faja won't fit everybody, even though your sister used it and it was amazing, and your other sister and your mother and everyone in your family love it. Please take a chance, try it out before you buy it. It's an expense that you don't have to be toss it off. If you don't wear a faja, a step to faja, or if you only buy it online, I'm really, really sure that maybe you won't uh, get the right size, or maybe you'll get it, but still there is some part of the faja that's gonna be hurting, and it's, it's gonna be hurting, then you're gonna toss it off and you're not gonna use it. So when deciding which faja is the best, try them out, everybody's different. And then on each brand, there are several types that it's like a sand clock, it's like uh, the big hips, it's like the ones for the smaller one that are more short with the white legs. With There are so many different types of faja that there is not only one that is perfect and so many brands of it. So uh, just stick to the good brands and make your own choice. I love it. Well, I think we've covered all of the really important topics I wanted to touch today. We talked about safety. We talked about the new technologies and the buzzwords that my girls get caught up on with different words and what they mean and which one's better and just a lot of confusion. I think we were able to clear some of that up today. And right. lastly, I would like for you to give my girls a recommendation or a tip that you would give to somebody who's on their plastic surgery journey. Maybe it's your mom, your, well, maybe not your mom, because your mom would go to your dad, <laughs> right? But maybe a friend or somebody who's on their journey. What tip kind of like, make sure you do this? Okay, girls, you're searching for a plastic surgeon, your ideal plastic surgeon for your ideal procedure. First of all, when you're choosing surgeons, don't stick only to one. Try two or three options. There are many good plastic surgeons. Just make sure that they are board certified, that they are taking care of your health in every step of the way. But choose the one suit that suits you best. He is the one that's going to come along with all your progress. If you're not getting along, if you don't really like the attitude of the surgeon from their uh, associates, from the assistants that are working with them, you're going to have hell with all your procedure because you won't like to be there, but you have to be there because it's the thing that uh, you try to accomplish. But still, it's going to be a complete mistake. So number one. Number two, don't buy anything. There are so many things that will try the people to sell you online. If you uh, leave them, you're going to go broke. Please reach the surgeon that you have chosen and see if they allow to use anything that they are selling you online because maybe they won't and you already bought it and you won't get rid of it so easily. So don't buy anything until you ask and you are really 100% certain that you're allowed to use it on your post-surgical process, that it's going to be needed, that it's going to be helpful, and that you're going to take advantage of it. If not, please save yourself some money. You're going to need it. The therapies are going to be long. The progress is going to take long to endure. So there is coming a time that you say like, oh my God, I have already 20, 25 therapies and I'm going to be needing 10 more. I cannot pay it. It's save the money because then you're going to need it. We cannot make sure how many therapies you're gonna need. It will depend on your own body, okay? So be prepared, have some extra money, and don't waste it on things that you're not going to use. And third and last, after you have done your selection of surgeon, after you have done the selection of procedure, this is going, uh, this uh, council is gonna divide in two. Please follow up the instructions of the surgeon. If they're telling you to do some things, if they're telling you to make some studies, it's because they want you to have a safety protocol and to know that you're good to go with the surgery. Don't try to force it, it's for your health. Be aware that these procedures are ones 
of the most big surgeries that are made on people. Not because we're dealing with the systems of the body, but we are dealing with too many amount of tissue. And it's going to be too many amount of swelling and as many amount of energy that is needed for the recovery, many blood, many immune system that is working along. So it's the post surgical process. It's really, really big. Please stick to the instructions of your surgeon. If they are telling you to make you some studies to see how your health is up, if you're allowed to endure the surgery, please think of your health. And last, there are so many groups on Facebook, on Instagram. You may get some tips because you may counsel someone of what was your progress during the procedure, how was your recovery. You may feel like, oh my God, for me work this, but but please, the last works on every comment, but ask your surgeon, okay? Because you can grab so many tips and then you won't be listening or, or you're not taking any path at all. You're only uh, trying one and one and one and one and one. And it's going to make mess on your recovery process. So choose a good surgeon. Hear about the procedure if the surgeon tells you. You're not a candidate for a lipo. You're a candidate for a tummy tuck. He's telling you wisely. Please listen. It's not for taking more money. It's because the result is not going to be accomplished as is expected if you go along. And remember, the incisions are made depending on how loose is the skin. If the skin is more loose, the skin incision is going to be more wide. All right? So please avoid uh, avoid to try to force your surgeon to a procedure that you're not candidate for and trying to accomplish the results that they're telling you are unreachable, right, with that procedure. So choose a patient, choose a procedure, take your options from surgeon, from the procedures, see all the perspectives, all what can be used, and then stick faithfully to it. Don't leave your surgeon's side until you are this fully discharged at all, and not from the hospital, from your entire surgical process, okay? You won't be seeing the changes like the Instagram pages from one day to another. Remember, this takes months. It's a marathon and a 100-meter race, you know? So please endure it, embrace it, and you will go along with it, all right? Because the change of the body is the easy part. The big step you have already taken it is the decision to get the surgery. Because you have been taking uh, into acquaintance that you want a surgery. You have been wishing it all along for many, many years. Every time you look at your mirror, there is some part of the body that we like that maybe we're not very comfortable with. And you have been thinking it for too many years. Now that you have taken a decision, please don't try to rush it. Take the steps carefully, and then you will be satisfied with the decisions that you have made all along. And that will make perfection on your surgery. Believe me. And then they'll go on and live their whole new life with their new confidence and their new yeah. the new person. A new person with new clothing and new uh, sensation and confidence. And you see the patients. And my wife, when I started with this, my wife was one of the ones that uh, helped me with, uh, with the office. And... And sometimes she covers uh, one of the assistants when uh, she's failing or she's on vacations and she fills up the space. And she loves that part. She loves when she meets a patient before and after surgery and how they they feel uh, realized and they feel like uh, they have accomplished that satisfaction in their lives. And it's not that you're not satisfied, but remember the, the woman's body change with Everything and with hormones, with diets, with the kids, to have the body that you once have once again is going to change your life because you're going to feel much better with you. Not do it for anybody else. It's for you. Remember, every change that you make in your body is for you and not everything depends on plastic surgery. It has to come with every attitude of change. Do not try to uh, suppress depression with getting a plastic surgery. Do not try to suppress bad habits by having a plastic surgery. If you don't make the whole change, 
then you're just going to be tripping along all the way. And you're going to be one of the patients that are coming at the office every five or six months to, I want to make another change and I want to make another change. And there's going to be a limit. Every doctor is going to put a limit, right? So exactly. be careful on that. 100%. Wow. I think that was the perfect ending note for that because I 100% agree with everything you said at the end. Everything about getting ready, making sure you're checking your surgeon and that you're going to follow their post-op instructions. You guys yeah. know, you guys hear me say this all the time. If you're picking that surgeon, it's because you already know how they're going to do their post-op care and you are going to follow their orders because that's their recipe and we're not going right. to change their recipe. Right. And even though my own recipe changes between patients, it's not going to be the same with the one that's coming from the United States, from the one that's coming from other parts of the world, or maybe between two sisters. They're different from each other. Maybe one may have a disease, or maybe the other one was needing a tummy tuck and the other only lipo. And the instructions are going to be specifically for every patient. So it's not a cooking recipe. Please don't try to take that into, into your head. Nothing is a cooking recipe. Every individual is that an individual. So the instructions need to be individualized. From the surgeon who did the surgery, what yeah. happens is they're in the Facebook groups and then there's too many cooks in the kitchen because they're following <laughs> this recipe and that recipe and that recipe and that recipe. And now we have, they're taking a hundred vitamins and 10 different fajas and this cream and that cream and it's too much. Right. And stick to your surgeon. I'm very sure that many of the surgeons that you may choose that are on the top, they won't leave you aside. They won't leave you apart. Please, when they tell you it's normal, it's going to be taken care. We have to take by steps. Don't try to, uh, if you have a wound opening, if you have a small infection in one part, please calm down. If the surgeon is fully aware of that, that it says he has seen you in the office, give it time. Any wound that gets infected uh, or any wound that gets open during your surgical process cannot be easily stitched up back together, right? Sometimes when we leave the wound with only wound carrying for maybe five or six days even, we're doing it for a reason. If we try to stitch it up once again, it's going to break apart. It's going to damage more tissue. It's going to make more fibrosis and nothing will come good about it. So be patient. Every step of the way is with patience, please. It's going to help you really, really well, much to endure the duel about the surgery, to, to feel not so exasperated with your family all along because sometimes we try to blame someone. And it's easy to blame the ones that are alongside with us. Normally, the husband takes a change. So I, I love when the husband comes along to the office with them because I say like, well, she's going to have it rough with the procedural process. But with you, man, I try to sleep now because <laughs> it's going to be hell for you. And you're going to be the blame from all this because of you. It's because this is the change that I'm making is for you. And they always telling me like, no, we already talked about this. this is because she wanted to do this. It's like, man, you know your wife. <laughs> Somehow she's going to backfire to you and he's going to end it up in blaming to you. Absolutely. That falls under. Make sure you have everybody in the family on board and yeah. they know what and, to and expect. Choose, choose widely your punching bag. So, uh, <laughs> because if you choose your punching bag, well, your mom as your punching bag, your mom is going to scold you. It, it won't look better. So you may choose a sister, you may choose a brother, you may choose your husband, never the mom. Absolutely. Never mom. <laughs> okay, Dr. Ramirez. So tell our girls, where can they find you if they want to come see you? They can find me. Well, I'm located in Guadalajara, Mexico. It's uh, one of the most important cities here in, in, in Mexico. We have the airport with too many connection with too many cities over the United States. I believe it's more than 27 cities where you can reach me and reach my assistance through my Instagram webpage is Dr. Pedro Matias Ramirez, just like that. 
I think uh, they're gonna be in the in the podcast. It's gonna be a a link. It'll to be it, tagged in the description. It will be tagged. Yeah. Just to uh, be easier for you to find it. And there is also a WhatsApp number on the Instagram webpage where you can text it. You can do it by direct message on the Instagram or you, you can use it WhatsApp. And my assistants will be happy to, to help you with. And if they ask you for a consultation before giving you an exact quote of the procedure, it's my idea, but it's my own way to know you before you come in with me because then you come i don't know anything about your story i don't have the time to see you but with your consultation that maybe be a virtual consultation or uh, in presence i will dedicate you a full hour to answering all your questions and to clearing your doubts and to deciding which procedure is best for you so when they are telling you that they can schedule a virtual consultation, it's ex directly with me. And it's for me to know you, to uh, talk and know each other, to see what we are trying to accomplish and where can we take your body into transformation, right? So, Absolutely. Uh, most of it in Instagram and there is uh, the, uh, the WhatsApp number and I'm working from Monday to Saturday, so... Uh -huh. Make sure whenever, you, if you reach out to Dr. Ramirez, make sure that to tell his assistant that you heard him on the show. Yes, please. I always, I always ask the patients, how do you reach me? And some don't say that oh, on the Facebook page or I'm acquaintance of one of your patients or anything like that. But I will love to hear that it's from the podcast. Uh, it will encourage me that I, uh, I didn't talk any nonsense. And, and, and I, you did and a we great were, job. And and I did a great job. It's my first podcast. I was kind of nervous about it, but I was getting along very nicely. Thank you. Thank you for the, uh, doing this easy and for uh, inviting me into this. Uh, You're very I, welcome. I had fun about it to be talking. It's good to to like enjoying the the talk of of what uh, the patients may think alongside and everything. And this was fantastic. Really. Well, you did great for your first podcast. You did great. I think you shared a lot of really great information with our listeners and definitely showcased your expertise on the topic of skin tightening, how far we've gotten with all of the technologies and just what 15 years difference 15 years can make as far as technology and innovation. Yeah, totally. It's uh, a whole new age and we have to explore the new technologies and try to take them to the limit and see what we can accomplish with it. And it's the thing that is fantastic. It's not experimenting. They are already approved. They are already, but trying to accomplish more to give the patient satisfaction. That is the thing that we like, that we see the very next time we see them before discharging from the hospital is the satisfaction on their face, maybe a little pain, I know. But the smile on their face and that they have already start the race because that's the point of start. Recovery is the starting point. Reco yeah. So it's good. It feels really, really nice. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. And I hope to hear uh, lots of comments about how great it is coming to see you in Guadalajara and getting the VIP experience during their body transformations. Great. You're um, more than welcome here and we'll be expecting you and all our patients when you want to come along please be sure to reach us and we'll make some time just to look into your case and hope to have you here and Absolutely. help you with your transformation thank you so much dr ramirez all right Thanks guys i'll see y'all next week bye so if you're listening to this episode and you're listening to the Big Butts No Lies podcast, you might be on your surgery journey. And if you are and you don't know what to do, you don't know where to start, you've come to the right place. I am so excited to do one on ones with you guys. I've realized as I do them more and more just how valuable they are to you, not only because you get my expert opinion, I get to guide you towards plastic surgeons that we know are going to do a good job and keep you safe. Besides all that, I get to talk to you about things that might not even be on your radar, things that you don't even know are possible. 
But since we get so in depth with our conversations and I really get to know what your dreams are and what you're really looking for with your body, I can tailor my recommendations to the surgeons that I know can help you achieve that. And taking the guesswork out of who to go to is invaluable. So schedule your one-on-one phone call with me. You can go to my website, go to the quick links, submit your information. Let me get to know you. Let me see how can we help you. You can get your own team. You guys, I have been working so hard behind the scenes to come up with a perfect way for you to have your plastic surgery and not only come out with beautiful incisions, but also feeling beautiful on the inside. So book your call with me and take the guesswork out of your plastic surgery journey. And don't forget, new episodes every Monday. I'll see you then.